Hi, welcome to the August 13th, 2021 uh, Club Cubase live stream. Uh, we'll get started here in just a minute. I'm going to do a quick audio test, make sure everything's going through as expected. Okay, sounds like everything's coming through just fine. All right, my name is Greg Undo. I'll be the host for the live stream today. Uh, if you have not attended a live stream before, how it works is you can ask questions in advance to by sending an email to clubcubase at steinberg.de or you can simply ask a question in the chat field. My ability to keep up with all the questions that are being asked, uh, I won't be able to keep up, but we'll try to go through as many of the questions chronologically as possible. Um, so at sometimes I may be behind 30 or 40 minutes from what's it, what the, it's going on in a chat to what I'm answering, so I'll apologize for that. We'll try to get through each of the questions as succinctly and as completely as possible. Um, when asking questions, if you could uh, include which version of Cubase you're using, so if I'm using Cubase 10.5 Elements or I'm using Cubase 11 Pro and which operating system, that would be helpful. Um, if we could try to refrain from asking the same question over and over again, that would be uh, great as well because that would just kind of slows down the whole process of going through the questions. Uh, I am presenting from outside of uh, Washington, D.C. area in the United States in Alexandria, Virginia. And if you're watching the live stream, please feel free to go ahead and um, introduce yourself and tell us where you're from. And this is, if this is your first live stream, let us know that as well. A couple people just wanted to give uh, a shout out to... Um, we will try to have all of the topics that are covered in the live stream uh, posted with timestamps uh, at the top of the comments field for the live stream uh, later tonight. Um, so we could do that. But if you wanted to search for topics that have been covered in previous live streams, you could go to cubaseindex.com and yawn from Stockholm. It's kind enough to kind of set that up. Uh, we could also, uh, we have two people that serve as moderators. Um, so we have uh, Agent K and Jazz Dude. So I saw uh, that Agent K is not going to be with us for the first part of the live stream. So, but they'll uh, do moderation when needed. Uh, so kudos to them. Another wonderful resource of information on Steinberg and many related topics that you, if you need to search through is going through um uh is going to the cubase nation discord so uh and jazz dudes involved with that quite a bit so um we'll go ahead and get started here in just a couple minutes we'll let some people get logged in if you learn something new make sure that you hit the like button and that enables us to continue to do these live streams uh and if you have not subscribed to the channel, make sure that you do subscribe to the channel and we will go ahead and get started. Okay. All right. So we have a question from Orrin Bynum from between, I believe he's in between DC and Baltimore area in the United States. Uh, <clears throat> so the question is, will you show me how to take my song that was saved in a folder on my desktop and put it in to Cubase 11 so I can open it again to finish working on it, please? Okay, so really all you'd have to do, Orin, and I know you're on Mac, uh, is come over here and just go to open. And then you want to go to, on your Mac Finder, go to your desktop and then just simply find the particular uh, project that you want to find. And then you could just double click and that will open up the, um... okay. So, and that will open up the particular project and that's really all that you'd have to do. So we could just come over here. I'll just choose not to activate that particular project. But at this point, you could just open. So just get a file, uh, open, and then you just, you know, if the project is on your desktop, just 
select the desktop in the left hand side and find the project file it could be in a folder or it could be just on the desktop itself and then you should be able to open it like that okay so we see that jan from stockholm is on the live stream and we have uno momento from finland is able to join us from the beginning of the live stream all right All right, and we have Scott Bogfoot from Newfoundland. We have Taylor Grove from Pine Grove, or Taylor Sapp, rather, from Pine Grove, Pennsylvania. Uh, and Taylor has a feature request, bring back the always on top for the MIDI key editor. So I think, you know, some of the, uh, you know, why it had changed uh, with that is a lot of the mid people will be doing MIDI key editing or will be doing the MIDI editing in the lower zone. So if we'll just show this real quick. So I'll just open up this particular project. So now when we double click on a particular file that this can always be resident here, but if we go into a, uh, full screen that there isn't an always on top, but I'll bring that to the attention of the developers again. So thanks for mentioning that. All right. And we see Soren from Sweden. Great to see you. And we have Sayi checking in from Nigeria. All right. And we have William Johnson uh, on his first live stream, uh, finally from Southwest Virginia. So. Thanks for joining us, and yeah, let me know what town. So you're in in Southwest Virginia, a fellow Virginian. Uh, so question, uh, last time someone asked, when is a song ready? Uh, I wonder when is a mastering finished? Thanks, Jan. So I think it's often going to be kind of a very similar thing. Um, you know, there's a lot of times with mastering, it's easy to get to the point of diminishing returns where as you start to run it through, you know, a myriad of plugins and processing that, you know, you, you know, it's easy to kind of get lost down a rabbit hole and you're kind of going for a particular thing and you may have to go through 70 steps to get there. But it's often just kind of a deadline can precipitate, you know, the completion of the mastering process. Um, but, you know, it, and it's really a lot of times, you know, you may have to listen to it in several different environments. So if people are listening to it, you know, if you're not, you know, one, th you know, 100 uh, percent confident in your monitors, listening to it on different monitoring sources. So, um you know, but it's kind of a very similar thing. It's often when uh, the record company needs it or when you need the production to be done. All right. So we see Millard Brown checking in from Scorching, Pennsylvania. So yeah, it's a little warm this week. So we've had kind of in Virginia, Northern Virginia, we've had kind of, you know, where it's super hot and then a, a big thunderstorm at night for the last few nights or it cools down like 20 degrees or so. All right. So we see thermonuclear war from uh from serbia and we have right all right so we see randy lee checking in it's great okay so i just see we need a teacher to explain in spanish too um so yeah, unfortunately my my Spanish isn't very good, but you know, I think that the live streams will have closed captioning that could be translated into Spanish. Uh but I'll mention it to our team to see if there's anyone uh that will be able to perhaps do Spanish live streams, but you know, people can often ask uh and use Google Translate and there's lots of people that will do that. All right, and we have uh Ahmad from Jordan and we have Mark checking in from Denmark and we see Michael Teams from Weatherford Texas so that means ice cream virtual ice cream is going to get started okay so we have a question uh when I select an audio event I accidentally press control plus g 
and an icon appeared in the, uh, in the top right, uh, three link circles next to musical mode. Do you have an info? So usually what that means is that if you've pressed control plus G or, or command plus G, if you're on Mac, that those events uh, will be grouped together. So now you could have events so that as you move one, that the the two events will be moved together. If you wanted to ungroup that, you could just hit select the events and then just hit uh, control or command plus U and that would ungroup. And now uh, if one is selected, they'll move independently. And I think you could just do edit uh, and maybe under functions, uh, so, but you could do, um, you know, group and ungroup right here from the edit menu as well. So once, once they are grouped, uh, you know, if I move one while they're ungrouped, but if I come here, select both events, group them, we'll see that little icon, uh, up here in the upper right hand corner. So now when I just go to move one, they'll be kind of tied together. So once again, just if you want to get rid of that, just go to edit to ungroup and you should be all set right there. All right, so we see William is from, uh, he's in Christiansburg between Virginia Tech and Radford. So I think, I think 85 people in my graduating high school class went to Virginia Tech. So I know the area well. Okay. Um, okay. So we just see uh, from Matthias Moen, uh, my first time uh, time tuning into the live stream. I wonder how do I find the BPM of a track I put into Cubase, say a vocal acapella from a song from the fifties. So a lot of times, what you you know, if you have something that will have some basic, you know depending on the material itself, you could come over here and, you know, I'll give you an example that will have some drums and we'll show you kind of, you know, the first thing to try and then we'll show you another method if you don't have something that's very steady and rhythmic. So as I come, um, then let's say if I don't have a particular tempo map, of this you know one thing that i would try first is to and this could really depend on the melody but if you just go to the project and just do a tempo detection uh, and i'll bring up this dialogue and we could do an analysis of it so now it's automatically determined kind of what the tempo is and it's extracted to tempo based upon that particular file. So we now have a varying tempo map that shows us the tempo of the file. Now, if you don't have something that's gonna be steady and maybe there's a lot of melodic pauses, you may have to just kind of figure out where the downbeat is. And we could use what's called the time warp tool. And as we go to the time warp tool, um, at this point, I could just say, this is where the measure is. I think this is where measure one is or measure two is. And you could manually move the bars to come over here and just align directly with the audio event itself. So this way we could just say, um, you know, as we are going to particular, I'll just, I'm here, let's say from scratch, and I could say, okay, as we're doing our editing and we have our time warp tool, we say measure seven is here, measure eight is falls right here, measure nine. So depending on how much information that you have from the original take, you could just kind of warp the beats to match the audio file and probably get a uh, a, a, a good, you know, representation of the tempo. So, all right. All right. So we have Paul, the guitarist from Lynchburg, Virginia. All right. Great to see you on the live stream again.
Okay, so we see hi, is there a way to change the tuning of my project to uh, another different from 440 hertz? Uh, I have a project with voice and guitar in 432 hertz, and I can't make the very audio to work with my vocals. All right, so, you know, what you could do, what I've seen people do if they need to do very audio stuff at, you know, 400 and to a project recorded at 432K is just come over here. And so let's say, you know, if we want, you know, so if everything is tuned eight cents flat and if we move, you know, you could take the vocal here uh, and choose to transpose it and there's a fine tune amount. So let's say if we go to eight, uh, so now as we do our very audio editing, so let's say, you know, we'll come over here and do the very audio so that this track is playing, you know, you can offset the fine tuning so that now that when you do tuning of it, that it will be compensated just by adjusting the fine tune amount here. So, you know, you know, pretty much you can capture any audio uh, at, you know, whatever tuning it is. But if you wanted to do like, you know, vocal tuning, then, you know, consider just offsetting the, uh, the vocal file here so that, you know, offset it by eight in the fine tune. Uh, and a lot of times, you know, people haven't had such a huge problem. So let's say if I just want to take this and we if we offset it by eight semitones, or let's say it's eight semitones, but not eight cents. So let's say if I go to here to fine tune. So it could be a pretty negligible amount, but you know, try just to select the file and do your fine tuning here. Uh, and then as you, you know, if you just, I think if you would knock your fine tuning to eight, that any of the changes that you make on a grid here to vary audio would, you know, would play back correctly for you. Okay. Okay. So, uh, all right. So we have greetings from Paramaribo. So thanks for joining us and uh, right in Romania as well. All right. Um, so we just see a question from Edmund. Hi, uh, micro tuner not working on third party VSTs. Is there another alternative? So uh, just if you're not familiar with this, um, so it really depends on like how the mic, how the instrument is set up. So let's say if I wanted to come here to my piano part, and if I go to my MIDI inserts, uh, and we'll go to our micro tuner here. So let's say, okay, I'm, I want this to be my root key of G and what this will allow me to do is to kind of take different notes And, and we could adjust the tuning on every single note that we want. Uh, and what makes this work is not that it's a, a VST or you know third-party plugin or an included plugin. It's just a VST 3.5 function. So uh, at this point, um, you could you know it's up to the plugin developer. You know if they support. Uh, VST 3.5, which has been out for a while, um, then they have this capability. But you know, there's chances that a lot of third-party plugins may not support that, and you should contact them if you wanted to do that functionality. You know, we have it as part of the VST plugin specification. So, but you know, it's we can't make the plugin companies do that. So, and it could be up to the plugins if they, you know, some plugins will have their own, you know, tuning scales. Uh, for instance, you know, if I go to the grand here, we could adjust uh, tuning scales. So as soon as we go into, uh, so here we could adjust your master tuning. Uh, and if you want it to, you know, come up with, uh, 
different, you know, pure major, pure minor for different, you know, keys. And that's part of the instrument itself. But, you know, the micro tuner plugin that's going to be, you know, for VST 3.5. So if the plugin isn't that, then, you know, you should consider contacting the other companies to start running the latest specifications. All right, so we see from uh, Matthias, it says nice, and uh, the tempo detection might just work and do the trick. So yeah, it, it does uh, some pretty miraculous things. Okay. Um, Okay, so we just see from uh, Tim Weinheimer from uh, Mission Viejo. Uh, hi, Greg. Uh, how do I remove the fader adjustments that a record, that a record into the project without affecting uh, any other adjustments? So I'm not sure if this is just like automation, Tim, um, but let's say if I'm here and I'm in the mix console, and let's say if I have fader movements, the fader adjustment, so let's say if I have, and I'm just kind of tweaking automation. So, afraid of smile. Think okay, so when we click on the plus sign, so if it's just a matter of getting rid of the automation, of the fader, you know, you could select the parameter that you have here. So if I just want it to, um, you know, select, you know, this automation, you could also just kind of click here and just say, you know, remove volume automation and that could get rid of the automation. But if I'm misunderstanding, um, I'm not sure, I'm just not clear on the fader adjustments that are record into the project or that are recorded into the project uh, without affecting. So if I had, you know, automation of EQs on this particular vocal, I'll open up the channel again. So let's say if I'm automating and I have EQs. And I want to adjust it. my send levels. And let's say panning. So if I have all these different parameters uh, and I wanted to remove just one of them, I could just kind of click here. Um, and if you just wanted to keep everything, but just remove the volume, if you just click there, you could just say remove volume automation, just like that. But if you want to do something else, uh, and everything else will be completely intact, but if there's something else you want to do, Tim, just, uh, let me know. All right. Wonderful to see Sable Winters on the live stream. All right, uh, so we have a question uh, from Maxwell Joseph. Uh, how to change the tempo of a full mixed audio file? So there's a number of ways of doing this. So uh, I'll just jump back to this project here. So let's say we have a full mixed audio file. Now, even if I don't know, you know, rough, like what the actual tempo is. You know, I could come there's a couple of ways. One is through like uh, an offline process. So if I go to my audio menu and let's go to processes and I go to my time stretch. So at this point I could say, okay, I want to do my time stretch ratio and I want it to be, you know, 120 beats. And this, I could do this in length and sample seconds or beat per, beats per minute. So at this point, we could just do the time stretching as kind of a big file. So that's one method of doing it. So we could just uh, apply the time stretch right there. So now as we play back, you know, we could just have that play back at a different tempo. Now we could also kind of do real time warps. So let's say once I'm here, if I want to just quickly do a tempo detection 
of a particular file. I'll come here and have it do have it do its analysis of the file. So as soon as we come, I, I'm going to just quickly find maybe the downbeat. So this will put everything into one four time. I will just say, okay, our downbeat will be here, I believe. So let's go ahead and just listen. So if I want to do kind of like a real time warp, really all I have to do is just come here. So I'm gonna select that file and I'll go to audio to advanced and I will <clears throat> Choose to set definition from tempo. And I could save it into the project or into the audio file. Now, once I've done that, I could kind of put in whatever tempo I want. So now if I turn off my tempo map, I could just type in a tempo. So say I want it to be 168. One twenty-four, and in real time it'll just do the time stretching just like that so once you figure out kind of what the tempo is go to your audio menu go to advanced and choose to set definition from tempo and at that point you could just type in whatever tempo so you see the original tempo and this is really ideal if the original file has fluctuating tempos which a lot of songs will uh, and then it can figure out you know the tempo at that particular beat and optimize kind of the time stretching algorithm for you. Okay, thanks for all the great questions. Okay, so just see from a question from Oren, uh, how can I delete a project with all the information in it so I can start all over again? So if I had just a, a quick project, so let's say if I just come over here and I could select all the events at con Command or Control plus A and then delete and we could have kind of all the settings stored there. <clears throat> And, you know, we could start afresh with the, with the existing tracks. Uh, another method that you could do is, let's say, if I go to, uh, I want to do a new project. I could import. I could just come right over here. So I go to new project and I could say, let's import tracks from project. And I could select a particular project. This is another method. So let's go to my. So at this point I could select this particular file uh, and say, okay, I want to do this file. And here I could select all of the events and I could choose, okay, I don't want to import automation that may have been, I don't want to uh, have um, or the events in part. So I could select everything without the data. So if I wanted to kind of have very similar settings, you could just do it like that. I'm going to just turn down my volume. There's a meeting I was invited to. That now I'm getting pinged with way too many questions. Uh, okay. All right. All right. So we have... Uh, 
Someone checking in from Cabo Verde. Okay, reading through different comments. Um, so I just see a comment. I'm seeing if I can catch some context. Uh, where to find it? Is it included within Cubase 11? I think maybe this is for, let me just see if I could find, uh, this may be for very audio or tuning. Let me see if I could find an earlier reference. All right, so I don't see it quickly, um, but let me see. Um, but if I'm... Okay, so this is from uh, Yousef. So where to find it is included with Cubase 11. So I think... If this is related to uh, very audio, I saw a response from Jazz Dude. So, but let me know if I'm if it's for something else. Uh, but if you wanted to do tuning, if it's very audio, what you could do is I'll just kind of come right over here, and if you double click uh, on the audio file, you could go into the sample editor. And then at the bottom, um, I could just kind of come right over here. And so we double click, we'll see kind of this spectral, the sample editor at the bottom. And then on the left hand side, you'll see very audio. And then you click there and that will do an analysis. And this will allow you to do vocal tuning uh, included directly inside of Cubase. But if I'm if I'm off, just let me know. Uh, just let me, uh, if it's looking for something else, just let me know. But that's included uh, in Cubase Artist 11 and Cubase Pro 11. All right, great to see Terry Dean on the live stream. All right. Okay, so we see a question. Uh, are there any convenient ways to automate the stereo out bus, uh, like, like adding fade out to an entire song without having to export and import? So yeah, you could definitely do that quite easily. Let me just come here. I'll just open up a quick project. So one of the tricks that you could do with this you know, one is just to automate the master fader. So let's say if I'm here, I could just come right here, click on the master fader, and I could just record that information and do a fade out on my master bus. Uh, if you didn't want to do that, you know, you'll see uh, on your input and output channels here, so once you do that, you'll see like your stereo out. And uh, at this point, you could just draw in and automate directly from the stereo out. Sorry, I'm just going to try to stop my messages coming in. All right, so, all right, so, but once you're here, you know, in the automation, so we could just say, okay, we're gonna see our stereo out, and then you're able to just kind of draw in fades here if you wanted to. So let's say if I just wanted to, all right, so we'll come here, let's say, okay, this is gonna be my volume control on the stereo out, and then you could even just, you know, 
grab the line tool and just, you know, if you want to do a fade in, a fade out, you know, you could just do that. So look on under input output channels, which will always be visible. So once you go to the input output channels here, um, you can just see the automation lanes appear. And that's where you could just draw it in or just, you know, physically automate the fader. Okay, going through some more questions here. All right. Okay, so I just see, hi Greg, uh, is there any way to tell the version number of currently installed Steinberg software without actually uh, instantiating the item and opening up the about screen, uh, Cubase, Halion, Retrolog? So I think if we, let's take a look, um, if I come over, to my finder and I go to application. So let's say, okay, I wanna find Halion. Uh, so if I say get info here, let's see if it will show the version number. So doesn't show it in the about info. So I think you might have to, um, let me just see if I hover at the bottom here, it'll show kind of, you know, what, which number it is, which version, but not necessarily like 1102. So I think that you might have to just, you know, go to the about screen of each of the, um, and just going to the about screen of each of the programs. So, you know, it could be uh, different just right over here. So it shouldn't take terribly long, but if you just go to the about Cubase Pro, then you could see the build number there. And you could also see if it's been downloaded from the Steinberg Download Assistant. All right. Okay, so we just see, uh, hi Greg, how do I put things in 5.1 surround? Um, so really what you need to do is to come over here, go to your audio connection. So what you want to do is make sure that you have an audio interface that will support 5.1, which will be like a, uh, you know, six outputs. And at this point we could add a 5.1 bus so once a 5.1 bus has been added and we route the audio track out to the 5.1 bus. So at this point I could double click and here I could now have my surround panner. So, so you need an audio interface with 5.1 uh, with six, you know, preferably analog outs and probably six speakers. Uh, that's the ideal way of working with it. And just go to the audio connections and just simply add your 5.1 out. You can add a 5.1 out in the control room for monitors. Uh, and then at that point, just simply, you know, route that particular track out to the 5.1 output and then you'll be working in surround. All right, great to see Kai Wen Franklin on the live stream. All right, so we have a question from uh, Savannah Isaacson. Uh, how do I add a plugin in multiple channels in one go? Okay, so let's come here. Um, I'm just gonna add I'll go to my inserts here and I'll just select 
let's say I wanted to I'll just revert this quickly, make it a little cleaner. So as soon as I come here, let's say I want to take all of these tracks, I'll select all the tracks. And then if you go to Quick Link, I could now hold down or just hold down Alt or Option plus Shift. I can now come over here and say, okay, I want this dynamic uh, on each of the channels. So just like that. And once Quick Link is enabled, whatever channels are selected, It'll add that plugin to uh, do this to that same position across all of your channels just that easily. All right, so we have a second question: How do I add audio instrument channels with a specific plugin? Also in one go, I've seen both these done in other DAWs. So you know, if you you know if you want to add. A, a you know a track with a specific plugin what a lot of people will do is just come over here and you have a track and you would just save it as a track preset so let's say if i come here i could just say okay i want this track to load up and i'll save a track preset and i could say this is you know default with SSL comp plugin. And then when you go to add tracks, you just say, you know, add track using track preset. And then you could just come over here. So let's say, okay, just want to go to track presets, audio. And then you, know, you could name it triple A something, but you, you could just say default with SSL comp. And then that will automatically, you know, add that track with that particular plugin on it. All right, I just see from Sven, a uh, great feature would be if we could uh, have an include plugins or track preset menu and the add audio uh, instrument dialogue. So again, just come right there, add track using track preset. So you, you could do it like that, but you could also just, you know, easily instantiate it across multiple tracks as well, which may be even faster. Okay. Okay, so we should see uh, from David Evans. Hi, Greg, and everyone new to the live chat. Welcome to the live stream. Uh, so, can you or anyone help? I created a project in Cubase 9.5 Artist. I recently upgraded to Cubase 11 Pro, but the project will still not open properly. Can you help? So generally the, um, you know, the files are compatible between the two. So uh, if you could let us know, David, what isn't opening or the project isn't opening, if it's opening differently or certain parts aren't opening, but you know, all of the, the, the actual project files, the .cpr files for Cubase are compatible. You could even open up uh, Cubase SX1, but maybe it's, uh, sometimes people may not have uh, like their plugin set up the same way between two versions and that could cause, you know, maybe like the plugin, like the tracks aren't opening with the correct plugins. And if that's the case, you may just have to go to the plugin manager under the studio menu, go to the VST plugin manager. If it's a VST2 plugin, make sure that you have the path here defined so that the VST2 plugin could be found but if you could be a little more specific on what's not opening up we could probably help you out a little better okay so we have a question from jeff sabelski uh, from chico california thanks for joining us jeff um 
best edit techniques to avoid the machine gun effect libraries aside a given uh, example slow triplets with solo viola or cello hearing a cowbell harmonic artifact how to unquantify in editor so let's say if i wanted to um let's just go ahead and i'll do a new project here and we'll load up a quick cello part So let's say we'll just Okay, so let's say I'll just put in some quick musical parts here. Just do some step sequencing. Put in some triplets. Okay, so, all right, so let's say, all right, I'll just fix a couple of annoying mistakes here. Or, Okay, so let's say this is sounding maybe a bit uh, monotonous, and let's say. So let's say it's all kind of. So, you know, often, you know, just coming here and saying, okay, let's uh, vary the velocities. So let's say I want the first note of the triplet range you know so and you could even make logical editor presets so you could say okay i want All right, so let's say if I just wanted to come here, let's go back and we'll just listen. So at that point, you could kind of you know do a lot of stuff with velocities um, or just coming over to the particular notes and I'll just make this a little louder so that it could be heard a little easier. And let's say I'll just slow down the tempo here as well so we can hear it a little easier. And sometimes, you know, like, you know, I always like to tell people, um, you know, like vary the length of notes a little bit so that it's not always playing, you know, like figure that someone's going to have to take a breath. Someone's going to have to move the bow, you know, and that you may have these little natural breaks between. So you could also just do some stuff like that, you know.
and you know those little things where you know think that someone's gonna have to move their bow someone's gonna have to take a breath change the velocity stuff like that can make a big difference as well Okay, uh, so we just see, why does sometimes Chopper go out of rhythm and go crazy, especially when write an automation for it? So sometimes, you know, some of the time-based plugins can go, uh, you know, might go a little off depending upon, uh, like, when the automation, if the automation changes occurred. So let's go ahead and just try Chopper here. So sorry. So if you've done automation, you know, what could be really critical with this is just to make sure that any automation that you do uh, is going to be just tied directly to the grid. So say if I just turn on my click track here, because if you make a change, so let's say if I automate here. So plugins like this that could be very, you know, timing based, just make sure that, you know, when you do these little automation points that sometimes that the automation is going to change on the grid. So you could actually kind of just select that point and come over here and just say, okay, I want it to be measure 21 instead. Uh, but sometimes people will make changes to time-based effects and then have that uh you know coming slightly ahead or behind the beat and that could cause some chaos okay so we have a question uh hi greg i'm not able to make the tensions appear along with the chord symbols on a chord track I could see them in the editor, but they do not appear on the track uh, on clicking them. What should I do? Okay, so let's say if I add a chord track here. Okay, so I think if you go to the setup voicings, so let's say if I just have triads set up here. So you, and you'll see the setup voicings here once you have the chord track selected. But now when I'm here, so I would check that. I mean, let me just check. So check the voicings here. Let's see if this will prevent me. I mean, it seems to be kind of working as expected, but you know, check here just on the setup voicings. And you know, see what you, what options you have there. If that's only going to be set for like triads, so let's see if this will restrict. 
kind of seems to work as expected here. Um, so give that a shot and just see if you have some something odd set up here in the uh, in the particular voicings for the chord. Okay, so we see from uh, David Evans, uh, who's asking about his Cubase 9.5 to Cubase 11. Um, so just, and kind of a further clarification. Um, so you're just saying if this helps, a lot of the tracks are missing. So are the tracks um, you know, are, do you get a missing files message? Uh, if you have audio files that are recorded in different locations or different folders. So it may help David if you, if you open up in 9.5 and if you go to the media, uh, and just come over here and choose and go to the pool under the media menu and choose to uh, prepare archive and that will move everything into a common audio files folder. So you could try that. Okay, so we see, um, how do I, chop a sample and trigger it on different keys in Cubase 10.5. So Cubase 11 kind of added this capability in uh, in the sampler track, but if you wanted to go to Groove Agent SE, this will work in 10.5. I can now come over here, find a quick drum beat. And then I could just drag it to a pad here. And at that point, uh, I could select the pad, go to slice and create slices. And now you could have all of these, uh, each of the slices appear on different keys from your computer keyboard. So once again, just uh, drag the sample into Groove Agent. So just take Take this into Groove Agent, uh, click on the Slice tab, create slices, and now you could just come over there and assign the, I'll shut off the Chopper plugin here. So now you can just play the particular samples kind of as you see fit. So just kind of come right over here then you could trigger each slice from a MIDI note. Just going through some more. All right, great to see Matthew Elston from London on the live stream. Okay, uh, so we see a question from uh, Jan for cubaseindex.com. Uh, using the pre-listening tool to listen to an event, uh, move the cursor to the same position where I listen. Is there any way to set the cursor to return to where it was before pre-listening? Um, okay, so I'm not sure if this is going to be the... Um, if it's this tool, let's say in the, if 
it's the uh, it's the audition tool here the play tool so let's say okay uh so move the cursor to the same position where i listen uh, is there a way to set the cursor to return to where it was before pre-listening okay so let me just watch um i don't know a way to get it back to you know so let's say just start playing it here say my cursor is here because it's actually working kind of with the timeline here but if we're in because you're actually moving the cursor to play the event so I don't know of a way to go back to the previous cursor position I mean you could set a marker if it was like a, a big workflow hindrance to kind of navigate back, but I think if this is a tool you're referring to, Jan, the play tool here, that, you know, it's basically playing from the song position right there, so it may not move the cursor, be able to return the cursor once you kind of just clicked with it. So if, if you want to, if you are here and then you listen to this, you may have to just physically, you know, move the cursor back. So I'm sorry about that. But let me know if I misunderstood, Jan. Okay, so we have a question. Uh, is there a way to link multiple events on different tracks so that whenever you move one left or right, all the tracks uh, linked to it follow? So yeah, certainly, and we could just call this grouping. So let's say if I have, uh, we should just, just a little earlier, so if I want it uh, like these three tracks, you know, to always be moved together as a single entity um, or those those events, all I'd have to do is go to edit and group. So, and then once I do that, once I move one of them, they will all move together. You could also hit control or command G to do the same thing or control or command U to ungroup the event. Okay, uh, so we have a question from CNotes. Uh, when saving track archives, there are two saving options, copy reference files, and I forgot the other option. Can you explain the difference between these? So if I wanted to come over here and export selected tracks, uh, we'll get two options. One is to copy the media files, and one is to reference the media files. So copying the media files means that when we do this, that it's going to include this particular audio file. Uh, so the events, the actual audio files here. So when I wanted to import that, it would copy that particular, it would actually import the audio file itself. If we just do a reference, the reference will say the audio file is in this location so that when we go to import the track archive, go to that location and find the particular file. So that could be a little cleaner for file management so that you're not necessarily having two files that are identical or the same, but if you're passing it off to someone else, you may want to copy the media files because that way when the XML file is created, the actual WAV file will be included with it. So that's more of a fail safe way if you're giving it to someone else. If you're keeping it on your own system, you know, probably referencing the media files may make more sense. All right, so I just see a uh, question, smooth scrolling for Windows. So, you know, I think, you know, we've had, a, you know, if we wanted to do 
just you know smooth scrolling i think that you know the i'm not sure if it's for windows os or for windows in the program in general like program windows but if i wanted to just you know jump down to and i probably have this all misaligned with my edits so but if i wanted to just easily come over here and just you know zoom in you know it's you know basically down to the sample level so it's pretty smooth a lot of times you know different video display drivers especially on the windows platform can have a, a big effect and while you think you may be running the fancy if you're running like the gaming functions in of your video driver <clears throat> that could often be working against you for cubase and for daws in general so Okay, so we see a question from uh, Sir N68, Soren in Sweden. Uh, I was doing the Haas technique on a snare swell mono file, first creating stereo from duplicated mono track, and then using the stereo delay. Uh, I got a lot of phase problem, uh, but a lot of red. Um, I got a lot of phase problems, a lot of red in supervision. Is there some way to avoid that? You know, so generally the Haas effect, if you're not familiar with it, um, is just a way, and sometimes, you know, if I wanted to take, if you're doing it on a snare, um, is basically taking two different delays and having those like be very tight together, uh, but panned hard left and hard right. So let's see if I, I could do this with just like a, a quick stereo delay here. So I will just add a stereo delay. Let's add an effect. Okay, so I want to, we'll just take this off of sync. So let's say maybe I want this to be eight milliseconds and maybe this one will make it four milliseconds. Okay, and we want these to be kind of panned. I'll set my mix up for these. Okay, so let's take... So say I'll go to my send. So if you're doing something like this. So, you know, you could do kind of like really tight, you know, but when you are doing delays that are, you know, milliseconds out, um, you know, that could, let's just make this, Let's try set this to 16 and 10. And just let me make sure I had the panning, right? You know, so when you are doing Haas effect stuff, so, you know, it is manipulating the phase. So it would be expected that you are going to see the phase anomalies. And, you know, don't worry about it if you see like a phase issue like that, you know, because you could use that phase and that's, you know, like people use phasers and that will knock your tracks out of phase. But it's a particular effect, a, a Haas effect being that you have the different delays that are so tight uh but panned opposite ways you know that is you know basically manipulating the phase to make it sound bigger so you will see that and it's you know if it sounds good it's good don't worry about you know the meters to kind of point out if you you know if you have a problem that you're not intentionally causing 
So. Okay, so we see from Jeff Zabelski, uh, I made a group track first time. All three instruments show tracks with the fader for the group channel too. Uh, the fader works, but no visual level on the group channel fader, and I wonder why. So if we come over here, um, All right, so let's say, you know, if I wanted to do a group fader, so the, the kind of fail safe way of doing this is just to come over here and I'll just go to a different project here quickly. You know, what I do, because you may have to, you know, one, if we have a group, Fader. So let's say I want to take all of these tracks to a group. Um, so, you know, if we add a group track, say I'll make a stereo group track, then I could go to my, you know, let's, so now we don't see anything being routed to the group here because nothing's been physically routed to it. But if I come over here to the sends, so now I'll say I want to send this to group one. So we'll come over here. So I wanted to turn this on. And now we see that this is going to be sent to the group as a signal because now our piano part is coming to this. An easy way of doing this you know, to make sure that the routing is set up. So, you know, make sure that when you add the group that, you know, like I just made a mistake myself is when you come here that you actually, you know, have the group being sent out via ascend and that you could vary the amount of that. A quick way of doing this also, Jeff, is to just select the particular tracks, right click, uh, and say so you want to add track and just add group channel to selected tracks and that will do all the routing for you. So now when I come back here, this group, all the routings are kind of just handled for you in a very elegant manner. All right, so I just see uh, from Kai Wen Franklin, uh, Greg, just wondering if Steinberg has any plans on updating the sampler track tools and setting. So, you know, with version 11 uh, just released in November last year, there was, you know, a pretty major overhaul from like sampler track 1.0 to 2.0. Uh, so, you know, but I think as we see new versions, there always will be small tweaks and enhancements. But if you have particular things, feel free to email me that you'd like to see. Uh, and you could email me at clubcubase at steinberg.de. All right. Um, all right, I see Michael Teams has granted me a golden opulent Sunday today for my ice cream selection. Thank you. Um, all right, so I just see there's been a bug in uh, my piano roll for a few months and was wondering if it's the same for you. Legato doesn't work anymore. It changes each note in a chord to a random size. I, I had it kind of doing something uh, a little unexpected for me recently. Let me just go ahead and take a look, see if I can find an example that might make sense. Okay, I think this would work so let's activate this project okay so let's say if i go to my length adjustment here um okay so i'll 
apply legato. So let's, I'll do that without notes selected. So let's see if I do this with note selections. So it looks like if the notes are selected that it might behave a little more, but I don't think that this was kind of behavior from a couple of months ago. Let me just Let's see if I turn this off and I'll set this to zero. Let's see if that makes a difference. Yeah, so I think it's been misbehaving for me. I'll, I'll make sure to kind of pass that along to the team. Sorry about that. Okay, so we have, uh, hi, my first time coming into live stream. Welcome, thanks for joining us. Uh, please, how do I create a group mix and send my mix to a bus? So if you wanted to, you know, just take uh, a group mix, I will come over here. Right. So if I wanted to send all of my drums to a particular bus, uh, again, we just showed this just a couple minutes ago, but we could just come right here, select all the tracks, and let's add a right click and go to add a group channel to selected tracks. We can give it a name. So now all of our drums will be coming right into this bus. All right. Okay, so I see from Kaiwen Franklin, uh, Greg, it would be cool if Steinberg updated the song temples, I guess, templates that are shipped with the program. So, so yeah, I'll men mention that along, but if you have any ideas for templates you'd like to see, just let us know. They could be, um, you know, incredibly particular for different workflows. All right. So we see Gareth is out of town with his daughter, Lola. All right. And I think I saw that Pablo is having a medical procedure, so miss having them on the live stream. All right, so I see, hi, how do I process my wave in Cubase 10? So if you wanted to just, you know, come over here, let's say I wanted to process, you know, there's a number of ways. So if you just double click, you go into the sample editor. And if you wanted to even, come over here you could go to your direct offline processing and if I say okay I want it to apply like a flanger on this guitar part here I could just say okay let's go to a plug-in and just go to flanger under modulation and now it's just processing that and if I wanted to take these files here I could put a flanger on those as well and at any time I could go and you know, if I wanted to just say reverse this guitar I could select that event So, you know, you could do stuff like that. So, you know, if you hit F7 and select an event, you could also access these directly from the process menu. So if you want to do like typical uh, sample editing or apply plugins or different audio functions, you could do it directly from there. And I could choose to select all of the events 
And if I wanted to just delete all of the processing, even after saving the project, it's no problem. All right, so we see from JBI, Greg, uh, thank you for these sessions, really appreciate it. So I hope it's helpful. All right, um, all right, so you see, how do I normalize my wave in Cubase, uh, in Cubase 10? So if I, you know, just wanted to normalize, you know, my snare hit here or this kick, again, just come right over here. Audio, we can go to process and normalize. And I can say, okay, I want this to be, you know, minus three. And that's really kind of all you have to do. So and you could normalize it based on decibels or loudness units. So either way. And again, that went to, if you do it just like that, you can just go to your direct offline processing and just remove you know, or delete that particular normalize. All right, great to see Charles K on the live stream. All right, just finding my spot. Bear with me just a second, sorry. Okay, we just see a question from uh, Randy. Can you do a stutter in Cubase? Um, so if you wanted to do like some effects like that, what you could do is, you know, one of the plugins that you can have is one that's going to do, uh, if you go under other called Loop Mash FX. So I could just kind of come right over here. And if I wanted to do, so if you want to do like different, And you could trigger these in real time from different MIDI nodes. So you could have like a 16th note pulse you want to do. Or do like different scratches. And you could just play this all from MIDI. So check out the Loop Mash FX for that, Randy. Okay, so we have a question from Rob uh, from Tarpon Springs. How do you activate the pull down capability with your mouse to widen the project window from the timeline? So if you want to do that, so if you wanted to zoom, you could just click here and that would automatically just allow you to zoom in just like that. And, and there is a preference because some people, um, you know, so if you just kind of click right here. Now, as you do this, it may move the playhead. If you didn't want it to move the playhead, just kind of come here and hold down the shift key. And then uh, if you hold down the shift key before you go up there, you could zoom in and out without affecting the playhead position. So that will allow you to zoom without affecting the playhead. If you wanted to zoom and navigate at the same time, which is like really helpful for lots of edits. Okay, I just wanted to go to the beginning here. 
or towards the middle, you know, you can just navigate like that and the playhead will go. But that's a, a great kind of way to do zooming and, and project navigation. All right, so we have a question. Uh, hi, Greg. Uh, question, is it possible to set different tempos for different tracks? So if I want it to um, come over here, so you know, I could have particular tracks that are in musical mode or not. Um, so if I want it to come here, I could say, okay, I want this track not to be in musical mode, but I want the other tracks to be in musical mode. I could do that. So now if we're at 100 beats a minute, and I go to 120 beats a minute, they'll all change except for that one kick track. So this track is playing. Now you could also, if you don't want it to just manipulate musical mode, you could also just choose to have this track and you could lock the different values to it as well. So anytime that you wanted to, uh, come over you could choose to lock the position so let me just find so if you come over here you could lock an event to its position to its size position and size so that way it'll still play back at kind of whatever tempo you want so you could record at one tempo speed the tempo up and have the audio you know so there's a couple of different ways to approach it for midi and audio Okay, uh, so we have a question. Uh, is there a way to make a MIDI event not follow the tempo changes? I like playing uh, live without a click and then setting a tempo after, but it always changes the entire performance when I change BPM. So let's come over here. Uh, let me just open up a quick example of like kind of rubato piano piece, I think. Okay, so let's say if I'm here. Yeah, let's say we're not really. So if you want the, so I'm gonna do a quick tempo detection of this, right? Because we could do tempo detection in MIDI as well. But if I didn't want the event to follow tempo changes, it's not at the event level, but at the track level, you can just tell the track to go into linear mode. And now kind of, you know, it'll play back at the original tempo, regardless of whatever tempo. So if I speed my tempo up here to 200 beats a minute, the MIDI's gonna play back. But if this track itself was in musical mode, it'll now. It can now automatically follow. So just make sure that the event itself, select the track, and it's not done at the event level, but at the track level for MIDI, that you could come over here and just toggle this to linear mode. Okay, so just see, uh, okay, just, hi Greg, I failed to normalize my track, how do I do it? So let me just throw in a quick loop. Let me just find something a little more musical here. OK, 
Okay, so all you have to do again is just come over here and processes to normalize. And that's really all you have to do. So let's say if I want to normalize it to minus 30 dB, you can see it automatically take effect right there. So if I say, okay, let's get to minus three dB. So that's all you have to do is just select the event, go to audio uh, and, and processes and normalize. All right, uh, we have a question. Uh, is it possible to remove string buzz and turn it and turn in a guitar recording? Uh, okay, is it possible to remove string buzz and hum in a guitar recording using spectral layers? So let me see. if I have, I think I may have a guitar example. All right, I'm just gonna import a quick audio file. I'll just do a new project. I think I have a uh, file that may work for this. So the the full feature, the full version, like Spectral Layers Pro, would have some more capabilities for this. But let me just import a quick audio file. Okay, so let's say maybe I have something that's typical Telecaster, single coil buzz. So let's listen to this. Okay, so let's say I have a lovely recording like that. So cool tone, but you know, lots of buzz and hum. So I will select this and let's come over and let's go to our audio menu to extensions and launch it in spectral layers. Okay, so I'll take it kind of full screen here. All right, so let's, let's say as we play this. All right, so I'm going to just take this particular range. Okay, and I'm going to come over here to process and let's say I just want it to um, let's get a noise reduction. I'm going to register that noise. And then back to noise reduction here. Let's say if I wanted to maybe do that another pass of that. So that's a pretty effective tool for doing that. So, um, so if we wanted to take a listen to that. 
versus let's say the original so you can kind of get a sense of what you could do with the spectral layers with that All right, so we have Neurotic Nexus who's smashing the like, so glad you could join us. I see Randy Lee's like button is done for him. All right, uh, so we see from Show African Towns, uh, Greg, happy to be live with you and the team today, please. Uh, how can I have Cubase auto-tune? Thanks, I will appreciate it if someone can help as well. So, you know, there's a number of tools that will be included with Cubase and um, Auto-Tune, you know, you could obviously run it as a VST plugin. That's uh, not an issue, but you know, if you wanted to do, uh, if you have like Cubase AI, I, I think, or Cubase Elements, you could come over here and use a specific tool. So if you want to go to uh, inserts, you'll have a pitch correct plugin under pitch shift. So if you go to the pitch correct plugin here, and here you could say, okay, I want it to be set to a particular scale. You know, like let's say, okay, I want to be in G major. And if you want it to be like a very processed sounding, you could just kind of put the tolerance and speed so if you're looking for that particular type of effect, or if you want to be very natural, you could also do some really cool kind of uh, formant shifting. So if you want to like singer sound younger or older. Now, if you want to do more graphic tuning, um, so that's the pitch correct plugin, but if you want to do more graphic tuning, you could use Vary Audio in the sample editor, and this will allow you to do all of your pitch correction. So I think you get the same functionality with built-in tools of Cubase, but you know, if you wanted to run Auto-Tune, you could do that as well. Michael Teams wants people to whack the like button. And in the live stream, I'm about uh, 37 minutes behind. So I'm at one hour into the live stream, just as a reference for some people. So I'm trying to catch up. All right, so it says, uh, you mentioned being able to set different slices to each key in Cubase 11 sampler. Can you show how to do that way as well? All right, so let's say if I go to my media bay, let's find a quick uh, drum loop or a loop here. All right, so at this point I could, so let's say, I want to take this, I could create a sampler track. Uh, and then once we're in the sampler track in Cubase 11, you could hit slice. And now each of the slices will be just uh, triggered directly. So you could just play it via MIDI. From your MIDI keyboard right here. So, and then you could even kind of just drag uh, the MIDI directly onto the event. And this will make kind of your sliced MIDI for you so that you could have everything kind of repeat and kind of 
construct and deconstruct your loop uh, very easily. All right, so I just see a question from uh, Ronnie Light. Do fine-tuned adjustments have to be entered for each numerical change, or can they can the entry be scrolled, as in Photoshop menus? I'm not familiar with Photoshop. Um, so, I mean, you could do it as kind of automation, but usually the fine-tune is going to be kind of fixed for the particular event, and you could have different fine tuning values. So if you want to have this be five and this be minus three and this be zero or nine, you could do it like that. But uh, I'm not familiar with uh, scrolled like Photoshop menus, Ronnie, maybe if you could specify. I don't know many other softwares well outside of Cubase. Cubase idiot savant, maybe. All right, so I see from uh, Rainier, how did I not know how to group like that? So. All right, so it says, uh, Greg, my other question is that each time I open up my Cubase, it just closes on its own. What's the problem? Hey, it really frustrates. Yeah, I, I can understand how that could be frustrating. So a lot of times, um, you know, check your, what I would do, you know, it could be related to third-party plugins. It could be uh, related to preferences or your audio interface or MIDI interface. So I would try to start the program and I'll just kind of show you what the option looks like. I'll open up kind of an older uh, version of Cubase here. So right after you start the program, hold down like Alt Control or Command Option Shift. And then what you could do is to temporarily disable the program preferences and deactivate third party plugins and see if that makes a difference and allows you to get in. So most of the time that will kind of do it. And it could be just like a plugin that's, you know, misbehaving and causing Cubase not to work well. So. just close out of this version of Cubase. So. Make sure I'm in the right one. All right, thanks for all the wonderful questions. Um, okay, so I just see from Marcos Gomez, uh, Cubase, do you partnership like with someone that did a 72 parts drum kit? Uh, is it like a sample set that you've done? So I know we've done some pretty big ones with, uh, I'm not sure if we've done a 72 piece kit, um, you know, but you know, we've done like the, uh, you know, I'll show you one that's been done. It's probably on the larger side is maybe the Simon Phillips jazz, you know, we have within groove agent, you know, percussion stuff as well. Uh, but there's lots of different, uh, options that are available, but you know, I'll show you just one of the acoustic agent kits. So we'll look at Simon Phillips kit here. You know, and this is with room mics for every single source. So we have, you know, octobons, uh, a gong tom. So I'm not sure if it's a 72 piece kit, but here we have three snares and we also have different kick triggers that you could use. 
uh, as well. So if you wanted to apply, you know, different triggers, so it might be 72 samples with all the different drums. But if you have a, you know, a drum kit that you sampled and want to do it as like groove agent content or howling content, uh, you, you could send me information. And I'll pass it along to the team at Steinberg. All right, so I just see, what's my cash app, Greg? I feel like I owe you. We just want you to be a happy Cubase customer. That, that's all the payment I need. So I do this as part of my job. So uh, I appreciate the sentiment, but you know, you could just, you can invest that money into Steinberg products. Okay, so I just want to, um, uh, let's see, oh, we have a question from Peter, uh, a way to automate enabling slash disabling a MIDI channel, uh, example, a short event at the very beginning of a MIDI track whereby I send MIDI note toggles, uh, the channel from disabled to enabled uh, via CC perhaps. Um, so maybe, Peter, if you could give me kind of the workflow, if you wanted to be able to switch between different tracks or if it's if you're editing events, you know, because sometimes if, you know, if we were editing events, you know, so let's say if I had... And let's say if I go to my list editor, so I'm not sure if it's for like a live purpose, Peter, or if it's you just wanted to quickly switch, but I know some people will go into the list editor here and say, okay, I want these all to be on, you know, channel two, you know, for that. And so maybe if you give me uh, more context, I don't know of a way to, with the MIDI CC, to kind of switch between the channels. I know a lot of controllers do that, and Cubase will read that information, uh, where maybe, you know, you could hit a button and it'll transmit this particular zone that's on MIDI channel three. This zone would be on MIDI channel four. But if you give me a little more context, Peter, that'd be appreciated. Uh, all right. So just see, um, hi Greg, it's been a privilege to learn so much from you. Is there a way to export two versions of track one with vocals and one minus vocals at the same time? So I've seen people will set up kind of, um, a, you know, when we're doing a particular project, they may have everything going to maybe like a pre-mix bus. So let's say everything here goes to, um, so let's say I, I add two group tracks here. So let's say I'm doing this. I'll just open up another project here quickly. We'll open up Beatles and Stones for Sable since she loves that song. It's a great song. So one way I've seen people do this, uh, they have to do this pretty regularly, is you know I want to take all of the tracks uh, and basically feed it, uh, 
And I could say, we're going to add this, um, or I'll just pray easier way is just to kind of come here and let's add a group channel. And we can say, no Vox. And then we could add another group channel. All right, and we can say everything. All right, so now we could have, you know, all of the instruments. So I'll come over here to my send and I will just do a quick link. And I could select everything, including the effects. And basically at this point, I want to send all of these to, and I'll exclude my two groups. So I want to send this to Novox and turn it all on. And then we could set the amount to zero dB for all of the events. So if you do that and then send everything to one group that doesn't have vocals, one group that has vocals and everything. And at this point, you could just set this up for your export audio mix down. And instead of just doing uh, a mix down, basically you could come here and just do your two group channels and export those. So that way you could have one done with no vocals, one done with all of the instruments and kind of create like a pre-mix group. So that'd be a way to do it. And we're seeing that uh, Jazz Dude saying uh, instead of using the Haas effect, maybe you use the Imager plugin. So, and you posted a tutorial showing that. All right, uh, so we say, hi guys, I'm a power user at Ableton and moved to Cubase. How does the sidechain works in Cubase? Some plugins have the add source button, but some do not like FabFilter or NI compressors. So you probably, it needs to be a VST3 plugin. So make sure that you're running the VST3 version of FabFilter. Uh, so I think NI just, you know, had contact updated to VST three after like, you know, 12 years or something. Uh, but so make sure that, you know, those, those particular plugins are VST three. Uh, and then you should be able to, once it's VST three at that point, you know, you could put a particular, you know, plug in on the audio source and be able to you know choose a side chain so you can say okay once we have this uh let's say even okay so i go to my compressor and then at that point so if vst3 plugins is what you need so make sure that you're running the vst3 versions uh and vst2 plugins don't really support side chaining so All right, wonderful to see John Costigan in the live stream from Kenosha. All right, so question. Hi, Greg. Uh, the control room on can add latency in recording situations. So, yeah, it, you know, plugins in a control room, if you have them enabled, can add to the latency. So, let's say if I add a multi band compressor here.
Um, but one quick way of being able to mitigate that quickly is just to uh, turn on <clears throat> in the far left-hand corner of the transport the uh, constrained delay compensation, and that could just bypass all plugins that are imposing a lot of latency in the system. But yeah, the control room can add to your uh, particular latency of your recorded signal path. So as if any, as does any plugin that's kind of in the mix. Just lost my space. Sorry, I'm just. Okay, so you see, uh, how can I add another instrument channel to the bus I have already created? I hope you understand I don't know English well. Um, all right, so let's say I'll do a new project. Okay, so I'll add an instrument track. So let's say we'll do retro log. All right, and I wanted to add this to a bus. So I'm gonna add a group channel to the selected track. So now we have this synth going into our group channel. So let's add another instrument track. Let's say a pad shop. Add one from Doomstrophic, it's an amazing library that Gary Gibbons did. All right, so let's say I want this patch shop to go into, so as we play this patch shop, it's not going into the group. But if I wanted to send this into the group, uh, I think we could just kind of come over here let's say okay let's go to the pad shop and i'll open this up and we'll just say let's send it to group one so now uh pad shop should go to this group and then so both of those instruments are going to the same group channel there All right, so I see question, uh, how do I use the LUFS meter? Okay. Okay, so LUFS is, you know, there's always kind of been, you know, two different competing measurement, loudness measurement tools. There's been, you know, DB, which can work in RMS, basically like the average volume as well as peak, uh, which will show you the peak volume. And this could get manipulated so that commercials could be annoyingly loud when you watch TV. So to eliminate this, there's a new standard for broadcast and a lot of streaming services called loudness units that is basically a, more of a set standard. So when we go to the meters to see our loudness units, uh, we could click on the meters on the tab here and now we just go to loudness here. So if I was doing this mix and I wanted it to be optimized for like streaming service is usually minus 14. I'm in pretty good shape here. I may just bring this down. But if I wanted to do this for broadcast, like for like a post-production for TV or film, I'd want this to be like minus 23. So I may want that to be there. So this is how we could find our loudness units. And we could also do this through the uh, 
supervision plugin. So if I just wanted to come here, I'll just add under the analyzer. And here we get to see our loudness meters. as well. So that's another way if you wanted to use this space for other things. Um, so I just see from uh, Nick uh, ask, asking if I did I happen to see the video I sent with the generic remote problem I'm having? So if it's dealing with the, I'm not sure if it's uh, the one, I think the last email I got from you, Nick, that I remember is where it was um, asking if you could scroll in the mixer with the, like a key command or somehow through generic remote in the mix console. And I didn't know a way to do that, but if there was something else, uh, let me know what it is, Nick, or if you want to just ask again in a question, I could maybe try to, um, uh, try to get it answered for you. Okay, so just see, is there a way to change the increment size of Gene H zoom button so that it does a larger or smaller zoom with each hit of the button? So that's gonna be kind of a consistent behavior, which I think makes sense to, to do that. You know, if you wanted to kind of, you know, vary the zoom, you know, I find that this, you, you know, if you want to go slow and then fast, you know, if you just kind of zoom by grabbing in a top uh, timeline here, that that is a good way to kind of have variable zoom rates, but hitting G and H will be consistent, which I think makes sense. All right, great to see Lawrence from Rhode Island on the live stream. Thanks for joining us. All right, uh, so I see a question from Jeff Zabelski. Uh, Greg, considering using a group track, uh, remark on levels then. Each channel can be pushed to you know, zero dB balance, then group fader brings the levels down. Would that improve quality of audio tracks? So it's not gonna necessarily improve the quality of your audio tracks. You know, It could just make a difference you know, when, you know, instead of, you know, like I've seen, I remember being at Michael Wagner Studios, kind of a famed hard rock engineer. Um, I think he's probably sold over 100 million records. So, you know, you know, everyone from Metallica to Motley Crue and Skid Row and King's X, um, you know, but he'll have like, you know, 12 kick drums. Um, so what he uses, you know, his groups for is, you know, just basically doing sub mixes. So we have one, one group that's his kicks, one that's his, you know, 14 snare mics, uh, you know, so that he could just kick snare and have everything kind of balanced in between. So, you know, it does allow you to have a different gain structure. One other thing that you do with groups is, you know, what a lot of people use is for processing on a group. So let's say if I'm uh, on my particular, you know, I wanted to take the drums as a whole and be able to process them. Um, we could do that as well. But it doesn't, you know, in the old days, people would use it to maybe get more gain structure. It's not really as critical in like a DAW environment. It's 32 bit floating point. Um, so you don't really necessarily gain anything, but you do gain some kind of processing. So if I wanted to come here, take the drums and say, okay, I wanted to route these to my group track. And now um, I'll show you, you know, so let's say, let me just undo that and I'll select all my drums here. And then, 
you know, I could add a, a group track to the selected channels. So as we do this, you know, now I could just have one fader for all of my drums. But if I wanted to EQ my drums as a whole, I could do that or apply compression on just my drums. So that way I don't have to do it on every single track. I could just do it on the drum bus. So a lot of times when you hear like background vocals, you know, it's like, oh, they're so tight. And it's because they're often, you know, run through a bus with compressor on it so that everything kind of sounds, you know, very consistent. So it could kind of make, you know, kind of add, you know, make everything, you know, very homogenous sounding. So. All right, um, so I could just see, what is your favorite Cubase trick we might not know about? Um, let's see, I'm, it's, I'm horrible at answering those uh, types of questions, but let's see, I think if you come over here and hit Alt-P, uh, let, me, no, let me just, I think it's Alt-P, that you can just play the particular selection. Uh, that's a good keyboard shortcut. So if you hit P, you can move the left and right locators around, um, you know, to this selection. But if you wanted to play a particular selection, you could hit Alt P, and that will loop the selection and play it. That that's a good trick that a lot of people don't necessarily know. But I would say, you know, the, if I had to pass on just one great trick is just learning the keyboard shortcuts and getting those into your muscle memory. Uh, that will speed up your Cubase workflow very, very fast. All right, so in the time frame, um, let's see, uh, let me find my, So right now I am two hours and eight minutes into the live stream. So let me see if I can find my, where we're at. Um, okay, so I am, the question I just answered was an hour and 32 minutes in. So I'm about 36 minutes behind the live questions, just as a reference. See, Jazzy, you mentioned the standard sentence. I use Cubase for X number of years and didn't know that existed as a feature. So that's why we kind of do these. Okay, so just see, uh, please, Greg, uh, I wish to know how to reduce noise from vocal after reading in Cubase. Um, so I think, you know, I just see uh, like the spectral layers that we just used is a great tool for that. So, but you know, the, the, the best way to reduce noise in an audio recording is try not to record noise. I mean, a lot of times, you know, you may be recording the perfect take and an airplane flies over or someone's mowing their lawn outside and that's kind of hard to do, but you know, check out the spectral layers that we showed on a guitar track a little bit earlier, but that's a great way uh, if you know, but you know, some basic gain structure with your mic pre and your audio interface can make a big difference as well. Uh, 
All right. Uh, so I see from uh, Jeff Sabelski, uh, Greg, would uh, pitch correct plugin work on woodwind instrument audio tracks? So certainly. So you could definitely just put that on any audio track. It's not necessarily limited to vocals, and you know you can get great results on solo parts as well. All right, we see that JVI is also a great fan of the Beatles and Stone song with Andrea singing. Okay, so uh, further, some more information from uh, David Evans, question about opening the project. So it was done on my old laptop, uh, Cubase 11, on new built PC. I use I put USB license key into laptop to open project, but currently upgrading um, to 9.5 Pro, is that correct? So what I would do, um, Okay, so it says uh, to 9.5, is that correct? Uh, as you said, look in the pool. Uh, it's taking a long time. So what I would probably do, another method that you could do, you know, because it could be that you're using audio files that aren't in the project folder. So an easy way to do this to migrate your project, David, is to come over here and on your Cubase 9.5, uh, go to your file menu and choose backup project. This will prompt you for a new folder. Give it a new folder. You can create that, uh, hit open. And then what this will do is it's gonna copy all the files needed in this particular project to playback regardless of where they are. Um, and you can give it a name. And at this point, this will you know, make a copy of everything needed to play back that project to a new, separate, unique folder. And then open that project in your Cubase 11. And that should, that should do it. And that will kind of collect all the files that may not be in that particular project folder for you. Okay, so you just see, uh, hey, is Cubase AI enough? I'm not rich, uh, but just wondering. Cubase AI is a wonderful program. So, you know, depending, you know, and it's a great thing of the Steinberg software. As your needs and expectations grow, it'll be there, but you could start off with something very simple. A lot of people could do all of their work in Cubase AI and be, you know, very happy. Um, so, you know, start off with Cubase AI and you'll know, you know, if you do outgrow it, you'll probably know when. And then you could just at that point upgrade, but you know, Cubase AI is a wonderful tool. So take advantage of it. Okay, so I have a question. Uh, can we automate equalizer like kick and snare increase in volume and when it comes up from flat to bass uh, in trance dance electronic genre? So yeah, we, you could definitely, you can automate any parameter. So let's go ahead and show you here. All right, so let's say if I have a particular project here. So let's say I want to automate some bass. So I'll just put, say, automation on the whole mix here. Then I'll just come to this EQ. Let me just.
All right, so let's go ahead and just play it back and now. And as my cursor's here, you can just see that the EQ is just automated that easily. So yeah, so that's very easy to do. All right, so I just see from uh, Jeff Sabelski uh, some discussion of VST3. So this is uh, Cubase 5 began using VST3, I think. I got the box set then. So I think it was Cubase 4 introduced the VST3 plugins. Um, so you see, uh, can I change the default snap increment in the MIDI drum editor from 16th to 32nd note triplets? I currently have to change all the lanes individually. So let's take a look. Okay, so let's come over here. Let's load up the drum map. Okay, so right now we're at 16th notes. Let's see if I select all these. To see if there's All right, so now we kind of paste in. So let's say we want to do thirty second note triplets instead. So as we paste in. See if it's maybe set in the drum map itself. So see if we could change multiple ones in the drum map. Yeah, I don't see a way to do it easily. Um, but if you want to email me, I'll play around. I was trying some different modifier keys, just like uh, holding down, but it didn't seem like it was changing multiple selections here. Try a couple of more keyboard shark cut combinations. Yeah, I don't, sorry, I, I thought it would be, there was a way of doing it, but I'll, I can play around with it if you want to email me some more.
All right, so we have a question. Do I really need uh, the iLock dongle to use Cubase? So if you have Cubase artists, you know, we don't utilize iLock technology. Uh, we have our own e-licensor technology. So if you wanted to, uh, you know, use, so iLock isn't used, but the Cubase uh, artist and Cubase Pro need, um, you know, will require the USB e-licensor. There's been a new license management system that will be announced uh, in the future. So, um, but we don't have much more information on that. Okay, so I just see uh, the generic remote is from Nick, uh, clarification. So um, he's saying the generic remote is not holding on to my commands that are set to my touch screen for specific tracks, for example. I have group tracks I want to be able to solo and mute from my touch screen. However, after I set it up all correctly, if I activate an unactivated track and throw uh, and throw it off all those track assignments. Um, yeah, so sometimes I think, and I can play around, and if you want to send me a link to the video, Nick, sorry if I missed it, um, you know, some things that, you know, could be throwing it off, like let's say if I come here to my mix console uh, and I have these tracks selected here, and then if they're disabled something I could be throwing it off Nick but it sounds like just uh, just a quick read is like if we go to disable tracks you know those selections go away in the mix console uh, so that may change some of the assignments and then when they're activated they show up again in the mix console so maybe it's something like that that's throwing off your generic remote settings. But if you want to email me again, I'll take a look at it over the weekend. Sorry about that. All right. Uh, so question, Greg, how do you make the volume loud and still be within the minus six db range that i understand is the standard level so you know it comes down to a lot of people use dynamics processing using you know limiters using you know compressors you know but a lot of it is just kind of you know typical gain structure in the mix a lot of it is arrangements you know, when there's a lot of people that have a lot of tracks going on and then those tracks kind of fight against each other phase wise, frequency wise, and can take away from the inherent, you know, they're still loud, but not sounding as loud and punchy. So, you know, sometimes keeping a, a simplified gain structure could make a big difference as well. All right, uh, so we just see um, from JVI, can you refresh my memory how to add earphones one and two to the control room for my UR44 for my second PC? Uh, so I think what you want to do is if you come over here, um, I don't have the UR44, but I think you'd see the hardware setup. Uh, and then once you're in the audio hardware setup, you could set headphones one and two to different buses and those different buses could be the output so that you could route it independently um so let me know if you have a, a problem but it's going to be kind of set up initially in the audio hardware setup or it could just duplicate the particular uh the routing from one headphone to the other output Okay, so I see this is my first time uh, at this live stream. Does it have a specific theme or can we just ask questions about Cubase? So it's really just intended for whatever questions you have, 
uh, in particular about your cue base. So just ask and we'll try to answer them to the best of my ability. Um, all right, so, so I just see, do you have any Cubase workflow tricks to speed up experimentation with different chord progressions? I know Cubase has a few options, but it'd be cool to see how a pro does it. Um, so I'm, I'm not a professional songwriter by any means, um, but a lot of times, you know, being able to kind of utilize different stuff. So let me just load up an example here. See if I have one. Load it up, I'll open up a different project. Thanks for all the wonderful questions. If you've learned something new, make sure that you hit the like button and subscribe to the channel if you haven't done that. You know, sometimes if you have like a basic idea or maybe like a sketch for a particular song, um, listening to it kind of in context can be helpful. So let's say if I just wanted to come here and so once you kind of go to the chord track, you know, you can put in a chord. You could have, you know, so hearing it in context is always good. So let's say, okay, maybe I want to do a turnaround here. And, you know, I, I studied, you know, lots of harmony, you know, and music theory all through college. So, I mean, I'd be the best person to ask for this, but say, okay, maybe I want an A seventh chord. But if I was looking for chords, so let's say like right here, like where it's gonna be a change. So let's say after four or eight measures, pretty typical. But you could go to the chord assistant uh, and base it, you know, on common notes or different musical cadences proximity to the chord uh, and this will actually kind of look at the the chords before and after or you can do it based on circle of fifths so let's say okay i want to do something close by but maybe i wanted this to be you know uh an e minor chord instead and you could just kind of try out ideas while you're listening to it can make a big difference. So that's some of the tips that I would give. And you can see that as you do this, like the MIDI will just kind of change depending on whatever chord you enter. So if I say, okay, I want this to be an A chord. And try different chords just you know, there's many great guitar patterns that have just been one chord and they move the chord shape up and down the neck, ringing with different open strings and it sounds beautiful, but the guitar players have no idea what chord they're playing. And, you know, good is good. Okay, so we see the tip about the uh, tensions for the chord track worked. So thanks for letting us know. All right, great to see Korean Jesus on the live stream. Uh, so to see, guys, how can I get Cubase free? So, you know, if you buy some hardware, you can get a free copy of Cubase LE or Cubase AI, uh, or you can get a trial version.
Okay, um, so just see a question. I understand the difference between the VST spec and the VST spec, uh, maybe. Uh, I don't understand why so many plugins are still being offered as VST over VST3. Is development much more difficult? No, it's actually pretty easy. Uh, it's a bit easier to uh, do VST3 plugins at this stage. So, um, so it's really, you know, maybe companies not wanting to update, you know, so there's still some companies doing VST2. Um, and we see it kind of as a problem, especially on some, like, I don't think you'll ever see VST2 plugins working on a, a Mac, an Apple M1 silicon processor. And we see uh, from JVI says, I uh, own a lot of uh, NI instruments are in VST2 and hence blocked. So, you know, Cubase still supports VST2. They're, your computer processor may not, or, you know, but Cubase there's still runs VST2. So, you know, a lot of Cubase will automatically block 32 bit plugins versus 64 bit. So. All right, so we have Graham Witcher checking in from the UK. Thanks for joining us. All right, uh, so we have a question. Uh, is there a way to make the output of one track route to the input of another, i.e. audio reamping? So what you can do is basically you could route you could route it through like a group or an output and accomplish that. So let's come over here to particular project. Okay, so let's say if I have this particular drum loop All right, so let's say I want to route this to a group track. Okay, and now I want to add an audio track. And its input, I want to set it to group one. So now while that's playing, I could come over here and record the audio from this track going to the group, the output of the group into this track and can basically just re-record like that. All right, so I just see a question. Hey, can I share this video? So it will be posted on YouTube probably about a half hour after we wrap up. So yeah, it might be online where you could share the video in about two hours. Uh, or you could just send a link to someone now if you wanted to. All right, so we have a question. Uh, hi, Cubase, is there any chance in the future that we won't need USB stick to store our licenses? Uh, it's very frustrating when changing computer or travel. So Steinberg has announced a new license management scheme that won't be requiring the USB e licensor in the future. So I think you know maybe the next version of Cubase might be on the new scheme uh but they haven't made you know much further announcements but it's heading that way 
But I do think that, you know, it's changing the computers is probably much easier using the USB e licensor. Um, and I travel with mine or used to kind of pre COVID all the times. Okay, I'm just gonna check. I think I may be caught up questions wise. Okay, so I'm gonna go, we had some questions that were mailed in advance. So let me go find some of those. Thanks for all the great questions. I see that we're at 96 likes. So if we get to 100 likes, that'd be awesome. All right. Okay, so our first question was uh, was regarding very audio. Um, okay, so we just open up a quick example of this. All right, so the question is, uh, in Vario Audio, I set color scheme to follow a chord track and I'm used to get three colors, red for out of key scale chord, light blue for in scale and green for in chord. Uh, but now I've discovered a dark blue also. What does dark blue mean? Uh, what does the four colors in very audio mean? All right, so let's say I'll come over here and let me just go to my chord track and we'll create chord symbols based on the piano part. And I'm going to set the color scheme here based on uh, the chord track. All right, so when we see, so as we see the green notes here indicate that these particular notes are within the chord, light blue is within the key and red is out of key. So I'm gonna come over here and let's just change this chord here, let's say a, a G to B chord and I'll make it a minor chord here. And if we go into the very audio, we can now see a dark blue. So this could mean that this note is with, when we see this, let me just go ahead and switch the back to chord track. Let me just see where I could. So when we see the dark blue, the dark blue means that it's going to be a note that's defined within the chord, but the chord is, but that voicing within the chord is out of the master key. So that's kind of what that means. Okay, I think this is uh, from Sven Isaacson. Um, all right, so he had just kind of sent a feature request for option for a single plugin window that follows track selection. Um, so if you had like one particular, maybe channel strip plugin that wherever you are at, uh, it would automatically, f you know, that could be like a default channel strip view if it's tied into a control surface. Um, so you could definitely, you know, so there's, I have heard some discussion and been in some discussion of maybe doing something like that. So. Uh, I'll make sure, you know, in the uh, Steinberg planning team, they'll see that we've discussed it on the live stream as well. Um, and I also see um, 
you know, and we had a discussion last week about, a, I think it was a UF-8, the SSL control surface, and if that follows Drax. And uh, Sven sent me kind of an email saying, you know, after six years, we could see that, you know, Steinberg has added the capability of following uh, the track selections with Yukon. And I believe, if memory serves right, that Yukon used to do that. And then there was a change in Yukon that prohibited that from working. So that worked for many years. And then it stopped working when there was a change to Yukon. So we added the option back to accommodate the change for the Yukon protocol. So it's kind of, and the since the SSL F UF8 isn't a Yukon, it's just using Mackie control or uh, Mackie Huey protocols. So, um, so, and I, I did have a chance to speak to my friend. I know we, the question last week was, you know, if the SSL UF8 would follow the track selections. So I, I called my friend who's like, you know, vice president of SSL uh, on, uh, spoke to with him yesterday. So he said that it will follow it, but you can't be in Mackie Huey mode, that you have to be in Mackie control mode which would also allow you to have the different tracks. Um, I've read on other control services that use Mackie control mode that it doesn't follow the track selection. So if you select the track in Cubase that it's not going to follow um, the, so it's not going to follow the, you know, like it's not going to jump to the selected track. You know, Yukon has the ability to do that. If you have like the Steinberg, the Yamaha Nuage or the Steinberg CC 121, it automatically does as well. So you don't have to physically navigate. But my friend said that it would do it. Uh, but you have to make sure that you're running it in Mackie control mode as opposed to QE. And, you know, they're both pretty old and a bit dated in terms of protocols for control surfaces. All right, so um, all right, so and we discussed this uh, a bit. So, um, so uh, in the last stream, uh, you told about you uh, told about Cubase export, but honestly, I don't understand the process. The main reason why I switched from Ableton to Cubase uh, is music for film. Uh, when I was finished the project, a sound engineer asked me for stems. Stems should be like parts, strings, drums, pads, wo woods, etc. Uh, so to be annoying to bounce it in Ableton because I put all instruments in these groups and then I was solo strings and then render, then solo drums, render, place drums and render. And it was take so many times because engineer asked me the stems with effects. So all inserts and returns track sends and of course uh in these stems was parts which go to one reverb or delay for example pizzicato strings and woodwinds go to one reverb uh, is it possible to do this in cubase and add to add to the queue i tried last night uh the last stream and no luck for example i put drums and bass to group low send these to reverb then i added guitars for example i put them in group uh, they go to the same reverb, for example. How can I export it uh, like the stems? Okay, so if you want to do this, because when we do this, you have to kind of set up your template, and composers will do this all the time, um, where we could say, okay, I want to just take this. Let me, you know, so let's say if we have effects and we have group channels, you know, so if we listen to this, I'll have like more reverb on my drums. So right now my drums are going to this group and a group goes to the output. So we could think of the export audio mix down as kind of doing the same thing. So what I would need to do if I wanted to include the reverb is just simply send this out to my drums bus. You could duplicate the reverb channel and say, okay, you know, I need to, you know, and at this point when we do our export audio mix down, so think of having like, you know, if you want to do this effectively is to have the 
actual re reverb return channels. And this made me having more reverb return channels, one for each of the groups. But now when I do an export audio mix down and I say, okay, I just wanted to do a single export of my drum group uh, and I'll just have it put it into, we'll create an audio track and we'll export the audio. That since the, we're exporting the group, the group is now going into the effects, the reverb is now going into the group. So now as we do this, so we listen to our group now. So now problems is sometimes it may kind of bleed through because the guitars are bleeding through. But, you know, if I, I would just take that and make sure that the guitar parts were, you know, and if I wanted to take my reverb and duplicate it, I could, you know, just duplicate that reverb and make sure that the guitars here are going to a different reverb within its own group. Uh, and if you wanted to kind of, you know, expedite the whole process, just make sure the drums within their group, that the reverb is within the group and being sent out that the, you know, and if you have to duplicate the reverbs, you, you know, if you wanted to simplify your export process, just simply come over here. I, I have passed this along to Steinberg and they're aware of kind of the conundrum you know, of the situation. So maybe we'll see some, uh, changes coming. Um, but you know, that's how it's going to work for now. So sorry if it's, you know, if you had to, so most composers will have their templates kind of set up this way so that everything could be, uh, just done, uh, you know, directly that way. Okay, so we have a question. Uh, why we need VCA fader if we could put instruments to one group and control volume in the group? All right, so let's say in this example, um, all right, I'll just revert this quickly. All right, so VCA faders are slightly different than uh, groups because you know VCA faders don't sum the audio. So let's say I have my effects going on here in my drums. So as we're playing along. So let's take my reverb. All right. So just for Okay, so let's say now when we listen to this kind of in context. So I have like all of my drums going on. All right, so when I bring these into my fader, let's say into my group channel, It doesn't affect like the gain structure of the effects get a uh, you know get altered by the volume level. So let's say I, I wanted to adjust the volume level and also keep the gain structure correct. So that's when I could select these particular tracks. So I'll select all my drum tracks and now we assign them to a VCA. Just come here, let's add a VCA track to just select it. So now my VCA doesn't affect the gain structure of the effect sends. So I can increase or decrease the volume, but if we have other tracks that are, let's say constantly going up and down and we have existing automation, I'll show you this quickly as well.
right? So now if we have existing automation uh, and we need it to actually kind of tweak the automation. So let's say we have like our tracks going up and down on our drums here. And let's say they're going in contrary motion. What I could do is select all of my drum tracks. Now let's assign it to VCA. So now I could bring the VCA down and it'll retain the direction of the automation even if in contrary motion. So let's say if I automate, I have automation going on in all these tracks. And if I automate the VCA, I could bring the VCA down and tracks that are going up will still go up but be kind of attenuated. But again, the effects level isn't changing. And if I bring it up, so if I have a lot of existing automation going on, I now could open up and we see when we go to the automation lanes here, I could see what is going to be affected, you know, what the automation, the actual automation is, what the result of the VCA is. And we could go to the VCA fader and we could say, okay, I wanna combine the automation of the effect of the VCA in uh, with the pre-existing automation. So that's one of the big reasons why we would use uh, VCA. All right, uh, we also had a question that was kind of sent in by Jan on Cubasis for Android in, uh, in keeping different takes. Uh, so, you know, and with the Cubasis on Android, I think in Cubasis in general, it will just kind of re-record over top of existing tracks, kind of like a looper scenario. And it works differently than Cubase. I'm not sure if there's a particular design decision why it does that or if it's you know if it's intentional for a particular reason but it is a bit different than the operations that you see uh in cubase all right let's go back to our live questions thanks for all the great questions hope that everyone's learning something Let me find my spot. All right, so let me just, uh, all right, so we see Terry Dean and take off, all right. All right, so we see Armis is saying I first used Cubase and Atari ST way back before modern times. Good old days, all right. All right, so I see a comment from John Costigan. Uh, thanks for answering the one million questions I've had. The complex album project I'm working on is going well. Thanks to me, or thanks to you. Thank you so much, John. That's great. Uh, you know, make sure you share some more uh, information, some more tracks when you get done. Looking forward to hearing it.
All right. Uh, so I just see a question. I always wondered if the random option in the MIDI modifiers randomly tweak the parameters each time you play it, or does it uh, stay the same as long as the values are not changed? So it will tweak it uh, every single time that it's changed. Let me just get to project so we can take a look at it. So if you're not familiar with this particular option, you can come over to the MIDI modifiers if you select a track. Um, and then there's a number of different kind of random options. And one of the things is, you know, if you kind of like a particular, you know, let's say if I wanted to randomize the position or, you know, velocity of particular parameters, you know, what you could do is just come over here and before you do it, you could try just a freeze play, uh, freeze MIDI modifiers, and that will write the randomness that's being generated into the part so that um, it will just simply, you know, be, so you could play it back. So it's not like, oh, you know, generate the most random thing ever that was beautiful and I can never have it. So at that point, just go to your MIDI menu and choose the freeze MIDI modifiers. Um, all right, so we have a question. Is there a way to grab all the notes which fall under a certain velocity? Uh, without using logical editor, I know in Ableton you could just click uh, and select based on velocities. I don't think so, but let's uh, give it a try. So I know that if we come here, we could say, let me just, so I think it's going to be using the logical editor. So I don't think there's a way to, you know, it's kind of a typical logical editor function where you can say, you know, select notes where value two is, you know, lower than I'm oh, sorry. So, because, so I think if you just come there, you could just have that select notes with velocity less than 40. So you could do stuff like that. Uh, but I don't know of a, like a shortcut way of doing it or a little trick. And you can just see from Sven, uh, for clarification, I'm concerned with the SSL UC1, not the UF8. The, UC, UF, the UC1 does not use Yukon or Mac Control. It uh, uses SSL 360 software to communicate with the DAW. So, yeah, you know, I, so I understand it's kind of a, a bit more of a proprietary thing. You know, some other companies have, you know, done stuff to make that work. Uh, but I, I'll check on the, on the UC1 as well to see if there's, a good workflow tip. All right, great to see Cubase Drunkies able to make it. Right. So we see uh, Zofo saying, Greg, you're the best explaining this stuff. You should get a raised stat. So I get free ice creams every Tuesday and Friday from Michael Teams. What else could I want? 
All right, great to see Daryl from Oakland and Michael Pierce. Okay, so I just see a uh, question. How can I use the sounds of the org in Cubase as a MIDI? Um, so maybe if you could specify um, what the org is. Um, so I'm not sure if it's maybe a Korg or you know, if it's a typo, if it's a Korg, you know, you can just simply, you know, connect the Korg keyboard via MIDI to a MIDI interface and add a MIDI track. And you want that MIDI, inter you know, you want that to be connected to the port to where your Korg is connected. But if I'm misunderstanding, you know, what org is, just let me know. Okay, so I see, is there a way to quantize all pitch bends after recording? I know how to snap pitch bend entries to the semitone grid. Can I select all pitch bend events and quantize them at once? Let's take a quick look. So it looks like one at a time, but you could just, I think, let's say if I come here to, if I wanted to select the different nodes, let's see if I could select the different nodes using the arrow keys. Yeah, so you could just use the arrow keys to select the different nodes for the pitch bend, so let's say if I'm here, and then just you know hit the left and right arrows to select the nodes, but it doesn't look like they could all be kind of snapped at once to the grid. All right, so we have Steve checking in from South Korea. Thanks for joining us. Okay, so question, uh, hello Greg, is there a way to keep the MIDI event window open in a separate window at all times? It seems like every time I don't have a MIDI event selected, the MIDI event window closes. All right, so I think if we come over here to preferences and go to editors, um, try to uncheck editor content follows event selection. So now if I select something else, I could still have my MIDI edit window open. So try that preference right there. So preferences under editors, editor content follows event selection. So give that a shot.
All right. So to see, is there uh, any comment on um, on Windows 11 compatibility? So I don't think there's been, you know, they usually don't make a lot of comments. I think, um, you know, Jazz Dude has been running the beta, but it's a pretty involved uh, QA process, a quality assurance process that goes through. So sometimes it's may not make a lot of sense to start the involved process until we have like a release candidate of Windows 11. So um, so I think that's kind of where it's at. You know, it could be just a huge waste of time to do stuff that's gonna be fixed uh, in throughout their testing, so. All right, so you see David Evans, uh, I was, all right, so we see that the backup project should do the great, or for getting his Cubase 9.5 project, over to Cubase Pro 11 on his new computer. All right, uh, one thing that uh, I think it's Cubase Junkie pointed out, so it's, uh, but if you have, let's say you have the sampler track open and you have a MIDI that's routed out to a virtual instrument, you could just drag and drop and it'll render it. And then you can now play the, that as part of the sample track inside of Cubase. Okay, so we have a question. Is there a way to use something like the logical editor to split a chord lowest, middle, highest into different MIDI channels and do this while playing live, not after it's recorded? Um, so nothing, you know, we could do it after it's recorded, uh, but I don't think, you know, if it's gonna be done live, um, yeah, you know, there's it could be tricky to to do effectively live if it's you know the notes are constantly changing. If you go to um, let's say a the input transformer, you could probably say, okay, I want to transform uh, notes. And you could set ranges, but I don't think it's going to do like the you know the lowest voice of the chord. So let's say I want to do um, value one. So you know we could say okay, you know notes that are less than you know C two, uh, and then we could say channel we want to set to you know set to fixed value or add. MIDI channels. So you might be able to set something like that up if you know kind of what chords you're playing or, you know, that these particular chords, but I'm not sure if it would do um, like, you know, the third within the chord or the fifth within a chord. You could do it after the fact, uh, but you can set specific ranges to go to particular MIDI uh, to different MIDI channels live using the input transformer. All right, great to see Mandy Lane on the live stream. Okay, so we have a... a Question, uh, Greg, in expression mapping, when editing shortening length of expression parameter, what does it do to the sample? Does it shorten it from the end or does it stretch the entire sample down? All right, so let's take a look.
Okay, so when editing shorten length of expression parameter, does it do to the sample, does it shorten it? Uh, I think that it's still going to play. So let's say, um, If I want it to, okay, so let's say if I double click here, let me just set my, note expression editor here. Okay, so I think it's this note expression editor that you're talking about. Um, does it shorten it from the end or does it stretch the entire sample down? So it's kind of wherever like you do the adjustments here. So I don't think it will actually affect the, the sample in any way, but how the sample is kind of played back. So this way we could just So you, you could have kind of more articulations like that. So, but I don't think it shortens the sample, but you know, cause this is on like the individual note basis. Okay, read through some more. Comments and questions. Thanks for all the great questions. Um, so I see, is it possible to save automation uh, the same way as saving a screenshot in the mixer? Um, so, you know, automation can be, uh, you know, it's gonna be, you know, on the event and it will play back the mixer, but it's not saved independently. You can choose, Excuse me, I just have yawns today. Uh, but when you choose the when you you can in, when you go to import a tracks from you know import tracks from selected projects, um, you could choose to not include automation in it. But you know, and the snapshots don't include automation, just like a still picture doesn't include video. Um, so it, and if you want it to be like part of a snapshot, it's going to work independently, which makes sense. Okay, so I just see, uh, and maybe a further clarification to Mandy's question. Uh, it says, because I'm working on a cover and sometimes copying automation is hard, so what about doing a screenshot on it and later use it? So let's say if we have automation going on here. You know, I think if you You know, so let's say if I come here and let's just select all events and copy. So if you right click on here, Mandy, select all the events and then copy. And then let's say, okay, I just want to come to another audio track. So let's say if I come here, let's open its automation and then paste. that you could do it just like that. So without having to worry about selecting the nodes and keep the playhead position at the same position. Uh, 
All right, so I think I'm at the end of questions. We'll see if there's any others. If not, we could wrap up a little early today. You know, it's a Friday afternoon in the middle of August, so we'll see if there's more questions. If not, we'll go ahead and wrap up. Okay, so I see just uh, a comment from uh, Jeff Sibelski is uh, in the expression maps. Set up, so it'll come over here to And then here we get to change like, you know, some of the length of notes. So I think it really could depend upon how the uh, so, you know, where you could change the length of your different notes here. Um, so it, it's really it may not, I think it'll just affect like the MIDI note duration, but depending on how the sample library is set up, it may extend. So it's going to be, you know, pretty library specific. Okay, so we see a question. Uh, can you show me how to quantize the end of MIDI notes? All right, so let's say. Okay, so let me just adjust the length of all these notes a little bit. Okay, so if I wanted to quantize the end of MIDI notes, I could just go over here to edit and we'll go to advanced quantize and we could say let's quantize the MIDI lengths or the event end. So here I could say, okay, I want this to be to quarter notes. So you go to edit to quantize or, or to advance quantize and you can say quantize the ends and that will quantize the end of the notes directly to whatever quantize value that you have set up. You see Green Jesus saying he feels bad asking beginner questions. So I think we've all had beginner questions. So it's no problem at all. We're glad to answer them. All right, so I see, how do you, how do we do our project when song has two independent beats, time signature? So, you know, you could do one particular track in one time signature uh, and then, you know, just lock the events. So let's say if I wanted to come here and I had, you know, you could lock different events to position and size, you know, so you could just lock events in position. So you have some tracks in three, four, some tracks in four, four, and then at, you know, 12 beats, it would line up. So you could definitely just lock the events of one particular track or one group of tracks pretty easily.
Okay, so I just see from uh, Mandy Lane there definitely should be an option to save all automation. Please do this for Cubase 12. I mean, so the automation is stored within a project. You know, we don't have a lot of people that necessarily want to copy the automation of one project from one track to another. Um, but, you know, you could copy and paste it quite easily or import just the automation from a particular project using the uh, import tracks from project. Okay, uh, so I just see, I had hoped that you would be able to help with my question about my Lisa's dual channel compressor 3630 to hook up to Cubase 11 Pro. I use Windows 10, so. Um, so yeah, it's easy. All you would need to do is, you know, have your audio interface, have enough inputs and outputs to connect it. Uh, if you wanted to use it, uh, we go to your audio connections, go to your external effects and let's say, okay, I want to have a compressor. So the Elisa's 3630 can work as a stereo compressor or two mono compressors, depending on if it's in link mode or not. So we say, okay, this is going in and out of, you know, this, you know, input and this output is connected. Uh, once we have that done, we can go to an audio track and say, okay, I want to go to my inserts. When we go to the inserts, you'll see it as external plugins. So let's say it's under compressor. What you want to do is to then measure the delay that will ping the system and automatically do delay compensation so that when you go out to that external processor that it will be in time. So, you know, that's how you could do it if you have enough audio inputs and outputs. Uh, otherwise, you would have to route it through a, a mixer or an audio interface that has like an insert point if you wanted to record with the 3630 during tracking. Okay, uh, so I just see uh, Cubase with a uh, Groove Agent 5 SE update. Do you see a, a standalone version? I did the update, but don't see it. Uh, the release note says it should be there. Um, so the Groove Agent, if you mean standalone version, is not running it as in running it outside of Cubase. Um, then, you know, Groove Agent SE is tied to Cubase, but if you have the full Groove Agent 5, that could be run as. Uh, an independent plugin or an independent, uh, just an independent program. Okay, so I see from Andy Lane. Uh, so, what I'm trying to say is sometimes you have like three automation lanes under each other should be an option to merge them together. Um, so, you know, Joey, if you have three automation lanes that are three different, uh, you know, three different parameters, it might be like panning and EQ and volume. So merging them together, I'm not sure if it makes sense, but you know, you could import and export, you know, the selected tracks or just the automation from those particular tracks. Okay, so just reading through more. OK, 
Okay, so I see from Neurotic Nexus to Groove Agent SE 5.05 says it's new features is standalone version. So I'll, I'll check that out and see. Maybe I can, uh, I can play with it before Tuesday's live stream. Okay, so we'll see if there's more questions that come up. If not, we'll wrap up a little early. Okay, we we'll see if there's more questions. Uh, if not, we'll go ahead and wrap up and give everyone an early start to the weekend. We hope that everyone has a lovely weekend. Okay, uh, so we have a question. Is it possible to preview the patterns in the chord? Uh, chord player so let's go ahead and take a look at that Okay, so we'll come over here to the chord pads and take a look. Now, as we play, I could... So here we have a guitar player pattern as opposed to playing chords. So if I choose this as... Uh, and I could choose the say pattern and we have kind of a guitar. So as I play one particular note here, And then if I want to have a different pattern, let's say I wanted strings. So I could trigger the chord from my MIDI note here and have it arpeggiate for me. And if I want it like maybe the roads to um, you just do like the block pattern. So we got two patterns. But, and if I just come over here, let's record quickly. So I'll just put this into record for these tracks. It's like as if I just kind of had sequenced all the arpeggios. Uh, we'll just kind of play back. So that's some of the stuff that you could do with the chord patterns. Okay, so we see, uh, is it possible to have two devices set to quick controls or is it import export the way to go at the moment? Um, so generally I, I, you know, most people will have one device set up for quick controls. You know, you could, I think you could, it's kind of set up for one device, you know, because so many people have eight knobs or faders on a particular controller keyboard. So you could have one, like the knob set up for quick controls and the fader set up for MIDI CCs so that they're kind of different and unique and will always be available. So, but I think, 
Uh, you could have, you know, the, you could have track quick controls and VST quick controls, like for instruments, but you know, most people generally run it, uh, one set of encoders for quick controls and leave another set for, uh, writing MIDI CC. Okay, so I just see I've installed several plugins, but I cannot find them. I'm running Cubase 11. So, you know, make sure that A, that they're going to be 64 bit plugins, and that when you're doing this, also go to your VST plugin manager. If it's a VST2 plugin, generally VST3 plugins are set up to go to a common known folder. But if it's a VST2 plugin, you may have to click on the little settings cogwheel in the VST plugin manager. And from there, actually set it, set the path where the plugin is. And then you could click up here and hit the rescan button, and the plugin should be showing up. Uh, one other thing, it could be sometimes plugins, if they're determined that they could cause system instability, they may get blo block listed. So you could, at this point, some plugins may just get blocked so that. Uh, because it could cause issues for stability. Okay, uh, Okay. so it says, uh, not sure uh, if I can ask it here, but how do I route my Cubase audio to OBS? My interface doesn't have a talkback option. Is there a workaround? So what, what I do, and I've found it works really well, is I have one audio interface for Cubase, and then I have another audio interface that is a, uh, a USB mixer, a Yamaha USB mixer, and my microphone and the analog outs from my Cubase go into the Yamaha mixer and I use the Yamaha mixer into OBS. So Cubase is seeing one interface, OBS is seeing another interface. And that way if I need to mute the mixer, if I cough or something like that, I could do it pretty easily. Okay, so just see, uh, have you encountered the issue where uh, when importing MIDI's data, sometimes VSTI's preset change from one preset to another. So generally what that could be is a lot of times MIDI files will embed program changes. So if you want to get rid of that, I think if we go to the logical editor presets that you'll see uh, there's going to be a preset for this. Um, basically to delete like program changes, let me delete patch changes. So you could do that. So basically a lot of times MIDI files will embed a MIDI program change. Uh, you could sometimes see it if you go into the list editor or select your program change here. Uh, but it, once you do that, then probably if you delete that, then you'll be all set, Mandy. Okay, uh, so it says, uh, while you're on chord tracks, can you review how to have chords created from played MIDI parts? Um, okay, so let's just jump back to this project. So if I have like a piano part here with chords, I could go to my project menu and go to chord track and we will uh, create chord symbols. So once we do that, then a chord track will automatically be created that's extracted from. So as soon as we come here, we can see the chord track and we go to the chord pads, 
click here and we say assign pads from chord track. So just this little drop down triangle. And now we watch our chord track will automatically uh, just be carried over directly to the chord pads. All right, great to see that Gareth has made it into the live stream and tell Lola happy birthday for us. Hope she's having a great day of celebration. Great comment from, uh, I just saw like VST2 is always a bit like hide and seek. Uh, so I just see a question is probably uh, related to the plugins. Uh, do I move the plugins to the plugin folder? So you can move it to one of the plugin folders or just simply if you go to the VST plugin manager under studio that you could just simply click on a plus symbol and then just add the folder where the, where the, where the plugins are. We see that we made Lola's day, Gareth's daughter. So that's great. All right. Let's see. There's more questions that come in. Thanks for all the great questions. If you learned something new, make sure you hit the like button. If you haven't subscribed to the channel, make sure you do that. All right, so I see from Tim Weinheimer, when using Groove Agent, uh, when I add the individual 16 channels out in Cubase, is there a way to export the names of each drum as well? Or do I use the logical editor preset? Um, so sometimes it's, let's go take a quick look. Let's do this in a new project. Okay, so let's say now I want to, you know, so right now we don't know which particular drum is being sent to what bus. So let's say if I go to my VSTI here um, and let's activate, let's say 16 outs. Okay, so let's say now we could see all of our outputs kind of here when we go to the instrument track. All right, so let's say if we go to the mixer um, and we send this to out to. So now let's come over here. So I think you may have to, you know, since they're just buses, it's not necessarily assuming that the particular bus is being sent to anywhere so that's when we could um have that so i don't think the name of the drum is associated with the particular output so you may just have to kind of name it as you go along or do the assignments tim
right? So you see from Andy, my plugins load very fast. You know, I, I just have an i9 MacBook Pro, so um, nothing really special with that, but all right. So let's see if there's more questions that come up. You see it's left-handers day, so you see Gareth giving a big shout out to Paul McCartney and Michael Teams, so both talented left-handed musicians. See QBH Junkie saying he loves the interface of Groove Agent. All right, we'll just wait another 30 seconds, see if there's any more questions. If not, we'll go ahead and wrap up. All right, so I guess with that, we'll go ahead and wrap up a couple minutes early. Thanks, everyone, for a wonderful live stream. We hope that uh, we'll see everyone on Tuesday's live stream starting at 1 p.m. Uh, U.S. Eastern. Everyone, please stay safe and healthy over the weekend. And uh, look forward to seeing everyone on Tuesday. Take care.